Hello, everybody. Welcome to the class on the roots of Korean Zen, the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch. I already <clears throat> have been teaching this class now since uh, last year in September. And I just want to remind people this is a uh, very important uh, text in Korean Buddhism, in Korean Sun. The Six Patriarch Platform Sutra. This is, uh, uh, along with the Diamond Sutra, one of the most basic texts that we use uh, to teach about uh, Sun, the Zen Buddhism. And uh, we have been uh, using the very new revised copy, which was edited and uh, revised by Zen Master De Kuang, who is the American Zen Master who lives in Providence Zen Center uh, in the USA. And he uh, went to Hong Kong and together with uh, uh, a nun in Hong Kong, her name is De Kuang Sinim. She also is a Sun Tsa, a Zen teacher. She and him, they uh, revised and re-edited this uh, English copy of the Platform Sutra of Six Patriarch. And this is a very uh, important teaching in our uh, Zen school, in the Sun school. And it's a very basic text. It's quite old though. Right now it's almost over a thousand years old. So we had to a little revise the English. <laughs> and this is a, the copy you have now in front of you. The book is the revised a version. It's very easy to read, very good. And uh, we have uh, already gone over the first six chapters. Now we're on chapter seven. We are on chapter seven. And we reach... Uh, Let's find exactly where we are. Last time I stopped was uh, chanting the sutra 3,000 times, fat tat. Uh, okay, yeah, page 209, 7.14. Chapter 7, point one four, page 209, ibek ku page. Okay, Ibek ku page. Now the last part of this sutra, there is a lot of a lot of it is the uh, interaction between the patriarch and various monks and nuns who come to visit him and ask him about the Dharma. So many of what we will go over is what's called temperament and circumstances various circumstances, he meet, met various people and taught them the Dharma, okay? So, uh, this is a little more, uh, he was a, uh, one thing that is important to understand about this book is that he would teach people according to their uh, character, according to their, what they had studied. If they hadn't studied something, he probably would not talk to them about it. He tried to, it's a very unique thing about the Sixth Patriarch, is he understood the people's minds. He understood their maum, jari, and he taught them according to their mind. So he did not teach everybody the same way. When he met the farmer, he would teach according to the farmer's mind. When he met the scholar, he teach according to scholar's mind. When he met the, uh, the monk, he teach according to monk's mind. He was able to adapt his teaching to any individual because his teaching was very fluid. We say like water. Water can fill a cup. It can fill the jug. It can fill the canteen. It can fill many different things, the bottle can fill many things. So the same way with the six patriarchs teaching, it was a very fluid. 
could teach many different people. So he had many different followers. And uh, even today, people still reading this book. So over a thousand years ago, since he was alive, maybe 1,700 years ago, 1,600 or 700 years ago when he was alive. And yet people are still uh, reading and studying from this uh, text. When I first became a Buddhist, uh, 20, that was uh, 1979, 28 years ago maybe. Is that right? <laughs> 29 years ago. I first became a Buddhist. Uh, that time I was living in the Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, at the Zen Center. I was living near the, uh, where I went to school, Boston University, and also is very near the MIT and near the Harvard. And one of the first Buddhist books that I read was this book, this book in the Diamond Sutra. And that was a very uh, interesting uh, experience. So we are now at the point where he is uh, uh, meeting various monks and trying to make clear for them what is the true Dharma. Because uh, many people had different notions of what Dharma is. And he uh, was clearing up many uh, mistaken notions. And we already went over the part <clears throat> with a story with Fada. Fada uh, was chanting the Lotus Sutra, and we went over this part, and the next part we talk about is 714. Bhikkhu Jitong, uh, he had read the Lanka Vatara Sutra near, nearly a thousand times, but he still couldn't understand the meaning of the three bodies, the Trikaya and the four prajnas. So he called on the patriarch bowed and asked for an explanation. As for the three bodies, explained the patriarch, the pure dharmakaya is your nature, the perfect sambhogaya is your wisdom, and the myriad nirmagaya, nirmanagayas are your actions. If you explain with these three bodies apart from true nature, then there would be bodies but no wisdom. If you attain that these three bodies have no true nature of their own, you attain the body of the four prajnas. So one thing that a lot of people, happen to a lot of people, uh, is, and it still happens to people today, when the Buddha taught the Dharma in India 3,000 years ago, he used many different words to explain things that actually are very difficult to understand, conceptual ideas. For example, he used the word, <clears throat> he used these words uh, about the three body, the pure dharmakaya and the perfect sambhogaya and the nirmanakaya. If you read an old Buddhist text, there are three bodies. And these bodies are the unmanifested, that which you cannot see, and then that which you can see, and that which is put into action. So similar in Catholicism, those of you who have studied in Catholicism like yourself, for example, know that in Catholicism we have the Holy Spirit and the Father, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. You have also these three bodies in Catholicism, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But where are these three bodies? Everybody has this physical body, you know. But where are these three bodies? So people kind of wondered about that in Buddhism too, because the Buddha talked about these three bodies, the pure Dharmakaya, which is like you said in Catholicism, you said the Father. It's like this God. But nobody knows where God is. Nobody knows what God looks like. Maybe we see a picture, God has a long beard, and God lives high in the sky, and blah, blah, blah. But we all know nowadays, you know, we take an airplane and we go high up 35,000 feet, and we don't see God. We don't meet God, necessarily. At least our idea of God. So it's the same, we have the pure Dharmakaya, which is, we say, uh, invisible to our eyes. We cannot hear that with our, with our 
years. But we cannot deny its existence. So many monks also, they had a question about this because people after the Buddha, when the Buddha was alive, the Buddha was a very good teacher and many people could learn from him. And when he was there, uh, people in his presence understood these things without question, without any question at all. It's like when you're in the presence of this kind of great teacher, you're getting the wisdom from him. But after he died and many years passed, many after his nirvana, many years passed, people no longer understood what these teachings really were. And people started to develop many ideas of their own about what these were. What is a nirmanakaya? What is this uh, uh, sambhogaya? And what is the myriad uh, uh, nirmanakaya, dharmakaya, sambhogaya, and nirmanagaya, three kinds of bodies. And actually it's very simple if you have a good uh, teacher to teach you this, but if you don't have a good teacher, it's easy to form your own a fantasy and get lost in your own fantasy and start to imagine that everybody has like three bodies and why don't I see the other body that I have and where is the body? Just as Catholics, uh, if they go to, uh, to Mass for a long time or they go to uh, you know, Cathedral Songdang for a long time, they don't question about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It becomes part of their existence, part of their life, right? So the same in Buddhism, if we actually, if you go to some Buddhist countries like Myanmar, like Burma, they understand intuitively what is uh, this... Uh, Nirmanakaya, Dharmakaya, and Sambhogaya. But in many countries like uh, China and later in Korea and Japan, people did not understand correctly what was this. So it was like great teachers like the sixth patriarch who had to fix many uh, incorrect ideas and many misconceptions. And the way he fixed this was very simple. He said, the pure Dharmakaya is your nature. The perfect Sambhokaya is your wisdom, and the myriad Nirmanagayas are your actions. So this is the way he fixed the problem because uh, uh, many people were reading the sutras and getting notions that had created something supernatural. But actually, the way he explained this was the Dharmakaya, this Dharma body, is your fundamental nature. What is our fundamental nature? Actually, when I talk about it, I get further away from it. Maybe I shouldn't talk about it. If I don't talk about it, though, people will be confused. <laughs> so uh, I have no choice but to talk about it. So the fundamental nature, we all have the same fundamental nature. Uh, for example, I often tell this talk in my, when I give Korean Dharma talks. When I stayed at Wagisa Temple many years ago, I stayed with my teacher who is from North Korea, from the uh, north, now what is known as the Pukan. When I stayed there, uh, he had a guest. And the guest came, and the guest said to him, I don't like Buddha's teaching. I read the Diamond Sutra, but it's a fake. It's false teaching. <laughs> wow. My teacher was very surprised. How can you say, he said in Korean, Gumgangyongun sagikyongyeo. He said, Gumgangyongun sagikyongyeo. That means it's a fake teaching. Then my teacher was very surprised because this man was quite a high minister in the Korean government. He was what, a changwan, you know, a minister in the Korean government. Why he said, Diamond Sutra is a fake, he's a sagikyong. So, he said, uh, in the Diamond Sutra, it says, if you have no sense of self, no ego, no I, no my, no my things, if you have none of these things, you will get unlimited, you will get unlimited uh, virtue, mer virtue and merit. So, you Korean people understand this, this is like, 
아상 이상 인상 아상 인상 중생상 수자상 없으면 무량공부독을 얻으느리라 그런 얘기 있어요. Then that meaning is very obscure to some people because this uh, uh, government minister he said he said to uh, to the monk he said if you have no ego if you have no sense of self if you have nothing at all who will get unlimited merit and virtue that's the point who will get unlimited merit and virtue he asked that question yeah if you have no ego you have no sense of self you have no uh, no being no nature how are you going to get unlimited murder and virtue then my teacher looked at him and said oh changwan minister did you ever go to uh, diamond mountain in north korea and he said yes and did you walk up diamond mountain and did you see the uh, big waterfall. Did you see the Kuryong Popo, the big waterfall, nine dragon waterfall? He said, yes, I saw that. Then he said, that time, how did you feel? He said, oh, very good. After sweat, many sweat, and climb the mountain, and then see the waterfall, very good, very cool, very good feeling. Then he said to him, that time, did you have ego? Did you have uh, self-nature? Did you have a sense of self? Did you have these things? He said, at oh, that moment, no, don't have those things. He said, that moment, were you very happy? He said, yes. When you were very happy, did you experience unlimited merit and virtue? Oh, then he understood. That moment, when he saw the waterfall, that moment, he and the waterfall become one. That moment is a unlimited merit and virtue, unlimited happiness. So the good teacher can show you the truth behind the words. But many teachers don't, many people get stuck on the words of the sutra. So it's the same here. The monk, in, the monk was asking the pure Dharmakaya, ah, the three bodies. And the patriarch said, the Dharmakaya is your nature. Everybody has this nature, but they don't understand it until they climb the high mountain and see the waterfall. Once you climb the high mountain and you really make a great effort and you see the waterfall, ah, then you remember your nature. Because your nature is obscured by your small selfish thoughts. So, he explained, the Dharmakaya is your nature, the perfect Sambhukaya is your wisdom, and the Nirmanakaya is your action. So if you're not thinking the small selfish thoughts, then you have wisdom. If you have a wisdom, we call that the Sambhukaya, the body, the second body. If you then put this into action, we call that the myriad nirmanakayas. So all these, th these three bodies is a name. It's a name for something we must experience by ourselves. We just had a one-year ceremony. Already the monks talked about, you must experience it for yourself. So even when we read this sutra, we have to experience the three bodies ourselves. We cannot understand it just through the words. We have to experience what these three bodies are through the deep meditation, the deep contemplation. We can experience these three bodies. We all have the three bodies, but we don't feel that way because we have many idea of ourself. This idea of ourself, very strong. We don't feel satisfied so this idea of ourself getting stronger and stronger. We try to satisfy this idea of self, but it's not satisfactory. It's something unsatisfactory about it. And even we try and try to satisfy it, sometimes we cannot completely, we don't feel uh, perfect. And so 
we get stuck on the imperfection of our self. And if people really go uh, crazy about that, they want to kill themselves. Many people want to kill themselves. Oh, many people, many young people kill themselves nowadays. Why is that? They look at themselves, they don't feel so good. They check themselves, they check their selves. But that means they already mistake a notion about themselves. They don't understand who they truly are. If they understand who they truly are, they don't want to kill themselves. If you see who you truly are, this infinite time and space. Infinite time and space. N not limited to just one body. Not just one body. We think about this body as me. We identify this body. This body is me. This body dies, I also die. But my teacher always used to tell people, this body is my rented car. This body is a rental car. You go to the rental agency and you get the car. And you drive the car for a while. Let's say you have an accident and the car crashes. And the car is destroyed. What do you do? Kill the driver too? No. The driver can get another car. The driver finds a new car. If the car gets old or has an has a engine problem and cannot go anymore, you send the car where? Where do you send it? Huh? To the, to the car cemetery. <laughs> we say the junkyard. English, you say junkyard. In Korean, pet chajang, right? Huh? Junkyard. You know, you know what junkyard is? Everybody knows junkyard. Where you, this is where you send, the, uh, you send the old car. So it's the same with this body. This body is old or broken or has a problem. Have to return. Return it to the, uh, to the junkyard. To return. You know, when I first came to Korea, uh, many people would talk about somebody died. And in the temple, they don't say, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a society, they say, they die, but in temple, they say, that means return, return the car, <laughs> return the car to the agency, got a new car. But just because you return a car doesn't mean the driver died. So you must understand who is the driver. If you understand who is the driver, returning the car is no problem. Of course, when you return the car, what do you have to do? When you return the car to the agency or to the, to the junkyard, you have to pay for it. So be careful how you use the car. Because if you don't use the car well, you have to pay more money. If you use the car well, you don't have to pay so much. So if you make a lot of a, a problem with your car, you have to pay more before you get the new car. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> One point, OK? So the body, we say, is uh, the dharmakaya is the nature. The perfect sambhukaya is your wisdom, wisdom body. That's a wisdom body. And the myriad nirmanakaya is are your actions. So when you see uh, somebody spring into action and do this, do that, then this is the nirmanakaya. This is the physical body, the physical action that's taking place. Sometimes when we see the physical of action of somebody, we don't really understand their character. For example, we see the really tough football player and he tackles somebody. In American football, when they tackle somebody really tough, they hit them really hard. <laughs> but sometime later, when you meet this person in private, his character is very gentle, even though his action is very rough, you know, rough action. So this means that this physical body of manifestations, like the nirmanakaya. Oh, OK? So this is a. Uh, yeah, in many religions you see these are three kind of body, like already we talked about in Catholic Catholicism, there's a father and the son and a 
Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So in Catholicism, this action is the Holy Spirit. They, they say that's a holy. <laughs> that's a Holy Spirit. Like in Buddhism, this a monk's action. It's like, uh, it's like a Holy Spirit maybe. <laughs> but we don't say holy. We don't in Buddhism. We don't like to use this holy so much. This. Okay. Next. He wrote a poem and he said, "The three bodies are inherent in our true nature. If you realize this clearly, the four wisdoms are manifested, and they are never separate from our seeing and hearing. Naturally, you will reach Buddhahood." Now that I have taught you, believe it firmly and you'll be free from delusions forever. Don't follow those who continually talk about Bodhi, but never put it into practice. So here he uh, explains very clearly that these three bodies are all in our true nature. That you, within each of your true nature, you have these three bodies. They're not something outside of you. Not something you've got to go to temple to find or go to church to find. You already have them inside you. And if you realize this clearly, then you get the four wisdoms. And then you'll naturally, you'll reach Buddhahood. That means you'll naturally become a Buddha. There's nothing stopping you from becoming a Buddha. Okay? And don't follow those who continually talk about Bodhi, but never put it into practice. So, then he goes on to ask, can you teach me about the four prajnas? And he explains, if you understand the three bodies, you should understand the four prajnas as well. Your question is quite unnecessary. If you talk about those four prajnas apart from the three bodies, there would be prajnas without bodies, in which case they would not be prajnas. So, again, we see many of the teachings in Buddhism are what we call expedients. I think in Korea, how do you say expedient? Bang pyon, I think. Expedient means. Many teachings are expedients. Understand expedient? Okay. So, four wisdoms, three, uh, you know, three bodies, many kind of things like this, the so four noble truths, we say these are expedient. We cannot look for them outside of our own mind. We have to look in our own nature to find these. But we can be pointed to them. A good teacher can show us where they are. Then the patriarch gave another poem, and he said, in the stanza, he said, the round mirror wisdom is pure by nature. The equality wisdom frees the mind from all sickness. The all discerning wisdom sees things intuitively without discriminating reason. The all performing wisdom is identical to the round mirror wisdom. So he's talking about the four wisdoms in the sutra and uh, how they are actually the same thing. They are not really different. The four wisdoms are all the same, uh, the same point, same nature, our original nature. Does anybody have a question? No question? Then we can finish today. Thank you.